to Just Asia, HRC TV's weekly human rights program. These are the headlines. Thai activists charged for attending Solidarity Walk. Indian police search for activists heading justice movement for dead student. Case against Indonesian labor activists withdrawn. Police in Assay province shave hair of transgender women. Protests in Hong Kong after democracy activists barred from elections. Welcome to HRC TV's Just Asia. I am Divya Padmanabhan. This week, Just Asia begins with Thailand, where seven members of the People Go Network and a sociology professor presented themselves at the Klong Luang police station in Patam Thani province on Wednesday. For organizing and participating in a peaceful solidarity walk, the activists were accused of breaching Article 12 of NCPO Order No. 3-2015, which prohibits the gathering of five or more people for political purposes. The eight accused had participated in the walk beginning from Tamasat University together with some other 150 persons on January 28th. They aimed to march from Bangkok to Kong Khan province covering a distance of 450 kilometers. The objective of the march was to raise awareness about the increasing suppression of the right to freedom of expression and the lack of inclusive development in areas such as community rights, natural resources and food and health security. Although the organizers had requested permission for the march, it was not granted. In addition, as reported last week by Just Asia, organizers and participants received various threats and were intimidated by the Thai authorities. A group of participants were blocked from leaving the starting point at the university for around seven hours. Plain clothes officials surveilled all marchers, taking their pictures and demanding to examine their ID cards. What is the significance of the solidarity walk? Uh, this event is very important because it is a symbolic events of the, the right to freedom of peaceful assembly. As you know, we live under military regimes over three years and that uh, usually restrict our fundamental right. When the more normal people try to organize that kind of event and the authorities try to block that event, it means that we cannot used or uh, we cannot exercise our rights to peaceful assembly in Thailand. Why do you think the authorities are trying to prevent it and harassing the participants? The fact is uh, during 19 to 20 January 2018, both police and military officers tried to block the marshals from existing university and they, I mean, the marchers were treated in the different ways and as a result, the people and the marchers feel uncomfortable to criticize their government because of the, the action of the police and military. But I think we all have right to criticize our government and it is uh, not illegal action under Thai law. How do you see the way forward for civil liberties in Thailand? It is very hard to predict it now, but as you know, we don't have the elected government and our government is not allow us to do or to exercise our rights, which is recognized by laws, even recognized by the constitution laws. So our civil rights or political rights is not sustainable and is very weak. It's easy to violate or harassed by the authorities again. It's not only the we walk event, but when we try to organize that kind of event, uh, you might feel afraid that you cannot conduct that kind of event in Thailand anymore.
Next in India, Manipur police surrounded the residence of activist Mr. Ahong Sangbam Tholan, convener of the People's Action Committee against the killing of Prabhish Chanam on January 27th and asked about his whereabouts. Fortunately, Mr. Tholan was not at home while the police were searching for him. The police then asked his wife to sign a paper with unknown content. The police returned the next morning and threatened the family members with arrest if they did not produce Mr. Folan. Responding to the police harassment, the women's wing of the Action Committee organized a sit-in protest near Mr. Folan's residence on January 28, decrying the police action against the person spearheading the mass movement, demanding justice for Pravesh Shanam and ending racial discrimination towards people from India's northeast. As Just Asia reported earlier, after Pravish's body was found in Noida, there were a series of non-violent actions by civil society demanding justice. These included sit-ins, rallies and protests. There were demands that the investigation into Pravish's death be handed over to the CBI Central Bureau of Investigation by January 27th. When this was not done, civil society members burnt effigies of the Union Home Minister of India, Mr. Rajnath Singh, Governor of Manipur, Ms. Najma Heptullah, and Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh, Mr. Yogi Adityanath. Meanwhile, the threats from the police against Mr. Folan and his family are continuing. Moving to Indonesia, Just Asia is pleased to report that the Jakarta police have discontinued the investigation into three labor activists of the Danamon Bank Labor Union. Due to significant public pressure on the bank and the police to release the arrested activists, including an urgent appeal issued by the AHRC, the bank management finally decided to discontinue the case. The three activists, Mr. Abdoel Moedijid, Chairperson of the Danamon Bank Labor Union, Mr. Muhammad Afif, Secretary General of the Labor Union, and Mr. Danis, member of the Labor Union, were arrested and detained by the police after being accused of criminal defamation and hate crimes against ethnic groups. The content of a video circulated by the activists on social media was deemed insulting and defaming, and they were hence charged under the Indonesian Penal Code and the Electronic and Information Transactions Law ITE with a maximum sentence of four years and a penalty of 750 million IDR. It is clear from this case that the Indonesian government must look into the interpretation of the ITE law and bring in guidelines to avoid fabricated cases and criminalization against human rights activists exercising their right to free speech. The government should also ensure that any prosecutions of actions relating to the freedom of expression are done after a thorough and accountable investigation. In the conservative Indonesian province of Aceh, police forcibly shaved the hair of a group of transgender women and made them wear men's clothing in a crackdown on the LGBT community that has horrified human rights activists. A group of 12 women were taken into custody during raids on five beauty salons early Sunday morning. The operation began as a response to complaints that women in the salons had been offering free services at their salons to high school boys as well as reports of drug use in the area. The police chief denied that it was specifically an anti-LGBT operation. According to the police chief, his men had shaved off the women's hair and given them men's clothes to wear as part of their coaching to become men. Aceh province is the only part of Indonesia ruled by Islamic Sharia law. In May 2017, two young men were caned more than 80 times after being found guilty of having homosexual sex. They were caught after neighbors barged into their apartment carrying camera phones. Finally, protesters in Hong Kong gathered outside the government's headquarters on Sunday evening after a leading pro-democracy activist was barred from standing as a candidate in upcoming elections. The ban on 21-year-old Agnes Chow, who was at the forefront of the 2014 Umbrella Movement rallies calling for political reform, is the latest blow for the democracy camp. It is also a clear sign that Beijing is tightening its grip on the semi-autonomous city. 
The government on Saturday rejected Ms. Chow's application to stand in a by-election in March because a party, Demosa, still supports self-determination for Hong Kong. Ms. Chow was among leading activists, lawmakers, academics and students who addressed around 2,000 protesters packed onto payments outside the government offices. The government is trying to get rid of all the political parties who are against them, she said. The pro-Beijing Hong Kong government has previously barred independence activists from standing for office, but Ms. Chow's ban is the first against a more moderate campaigner. Since the umbrella movement ended with no concessions on reform, there have been increasing signs the city's cherished freedoms are under threat. Concerns over the erosion of rights in Hong Kong were raised in the British Parliament's House of Commons and House of Lords last week. That is all for this episode of Just Asia. For more on these and other issues, please visit www.humanrights.asia or www.alrc.asia/justasia. Thank you for watching and see you next week.